On this episode of Missouri Life, we're in St. Genevieve, where we examine posts in the earth, see how water can reflect life, watch a couple making their mark on an antique craft, get wined and dined at a gourmet grill, and meet a man preserving local history. All that and more coming up next on Missouri Life. Production support is provided by Missouri Life Magazine and by viewers like you. Thank you. Welcome to another episode of Missouri Life. I'm your host, Meredith Haynes. Thanks so much for joining us. Dendrochronology, it's the science of analyzing the patterns of annual growth rings in trees to date events, environmental changes, and artifacts. Using this technique, the Green Tree Tavern has officially been dated to the year 1790, making it the oldest verified vertical log building in St. Genevieve. Let's get our journey of discovery underway and find out more about Missouri's oldest town. We've explored beautiful St. Genevieve and the history in this town is amazing. The stone structures to everybody's placards on their, on their homes indicating, you know, when it was built. Let's talk about the house that's that's behind us. It yes. had a pretty big day today. What is so special about this house and, and who lived here? Okay, there's two styles of French houses here, and it's in the method of construction. The first uh, uh, and the most typical in the new town is called the toast or so, post on a sill, which is a limestone. But in the old town, the, on the deeds that I've seen from the old town, about 30 of them, there was always post in the ground where they actually bury the walls five to six feet in the ground. This house is, it's called the Toes on Terre, post in the ground. There's only five of those left in the United States. Three of them are here. This J.B. Uh, Beauvais Amaro house, just about 35, 40 steps there is the Beckett Ribot, and then uptown is the Vital St. Jim Beauvais. And those are very, very unique. And the, the fact that we still have them in their original location, they were not moved from someplace, they are here. How have they stood the test of time? Because everything still looks original well, in the homes. A, well, a lot of it, uh, it's because of how they, what woods they used. Uh, they used a lot of native cedar. Some say they charred the ends of it to make it a little more rot resistant. Uh, but that's, people lived in these houses. I mean, St. Louis progressed and they tore all the French houses down, down on the riverfront when the warehouses came in. And we didn't develop economically like St. Louis, so people just lived in these houses. And that's why we have them today. As an engineer, I'm pretty amazed. These houses survived the, the 1811 New Madrid earthquake. So that says something. And uh, the more I got into it though, there's more than just wood and shingles. There's people that lived here. Most of the people that settled this area actually settled on the east side of the river in Cahokia, uh, Kaskaskia, Prairie de Rocher, St. Philippe, St. Anne. They were typically French Canadians that had come down from Quebec and, and Montreal by canoe and, and settled in this area. Uh, they were primarily farmers and fur trappers and lead miners and that sort. And then in the sometime between 1735 and 1745 they started coming across the river here. We were French until 1762 and then the, the Seven Year War was going on. And the, and the French king, on a secret treaty, gave all the land west of the Mississippi to, to his cousin Charles of Spain. And so we became Spanish. But the Spanish really didn't influence us all that much. We st kept our French culture and traditions and food. And so we were Spanish until about 1800. Then we went back to France for four years. And then with the Louisiana Purchase, we became American. Uh, we were a, a confluence of people and cultures. I mean. Native American, African American, true Frenchmen, French Canadians, English or Bostonese as they called them. And they have different foods, different languages, and how do you, how does that all come together? Becoming a National Historical Park ensures that this all but forgotten piece of American colonial history is protected for future generations. 
We have been a National Historic Landmark District since 1960. The National Park is going to give us national attention to what this, this French period, how they farmed and what, what they did, uh, and all these confluence of cultures and the people, and then you marry it with the architecture that we have. That's what makes this exciting, and that's what they're going to be able to do in this national park, and, and bring the attention to the American public that there was there was a, a development in the mid Mississippi Valley, same time as the American colonies are being developed, and most people uh, you don't even learn about it in a lot of Missouri schools. Uh, a, a lot of people think that Missouri started with the Louisiana Purchase and Lewis and Clark. Mm -hmm. We had been here for maybe 65 years before that, and so that's how we tell the story of St. Denis to the people that lived here. Astral Sea Limited began as an incense, bath salt, and perfume oil manufacturer. But when demand for American-made fragrance accessories wasn't being met, ASL rose to meet the need with their own handcrafted pewter. And we had decided on pewter because it was something that we could work compatibly with the incense, which is a very dusty business. So uh, we decided on pewter. We, we began from there really focusing on early American reproduction. We've gotten now to where we also do contemporary things. We do a lot of things inspired by Georgian silver, which was very fancy, highly decorated. So things like, like the soup tureen, uh, the body on that spun on the lathe, uh, the lid is spun on the lathe, all of the leaves are cast and then applied. And, um, and that's something based on, on silver pieces from an earlier period than, than the colonial pewter that we're more familiar with. Um, but that's what they would have done. So we're still keeping history alive. We're entirely, almost entirely um, self-taught. There's nobody to teach it. Tom had two half days of instruction on metal spinning with the lathe, um, but, but that's it. At the end of the second half day, the guy that taught him said, well, that's what I can teach you, go ruin some metal. Well, metal spinning is basically, you have a flat sheet, we lock it into the lathe just by friction, and then with wooden tools, manipulate it over the uh, form. The tool rest, most lathes, people are removing things, like removing wood or, or metal. And we use a lathe that's, that's basically a kind of a hybrid between a wood lathe and a metal lathe. Uh, once we create the form, we lock the metal piece in and then slowly move it up. The tool rest has fulcrum points on it, pins, that you magnify the force you're putting on it. Um, almost everybody in America has a set of stainless steel mixing bowls. That's the same way those bowls are made, but those are made in a, in a factory where they have mechanical arms and pneumatics and things to, to do those pieces. And all, all of ours are hand spun and it's just you know, a relationship with wooden sticks manipulating the metal into the shape that we want. Along with their hand-spun creations, ASL also utilizes molds to make pieces both new and antique. We have well over 200 molds that predate 1840. Uh, another probably 40 or so that are between 1870 and 1930 that we call vintage molds. Um, our oldest molds are two spoon molds from about 1650. Um, we have two three molds that I know are French. One is a spoon mold, uh, one is a large spoon about this big that's actually a stuffing spoon. And then we have a crucifix that we make. Um, it's about this tall. The mold is from 1750 and it was made in Paris. And we have one mold that's a mug body that was made in a Philadelphia foundry in about 1790. And um, we know, I'm sorry, in about 1760, it's an early one. Uh, we know of one other in existence in a museum, but as far as we're aware, we have the only one that's being used. And, um, and we've just been collecting pretty much since that, that first purchase. So most of our plates 
most of our candlesticks, uh, most of our flatware, a mug, an inkwell, some trays, all done in those antique molds. The things that we're making, I mean, we're still doing salt cellars, um, goblets, tankards, mugs, candlesticks. It's the same stuff. We just sometimes decorate them a little differently. Like we do an oil lamp that's octopus tentacles. Is that traditional pewter? No. Is it fun? Oh, heck yeah. <laughs> I can't imagine doing anything else at this point. Um, I, I like working with my hands. Uh, I don't consider myself really an artist. I'm a craftsman and, and happy to be. I'm a tradesman. Being a craftsman, being a tradesman, knowing that what I'm doing with my stuff um, is something that's been done for thousands of years in pretty much the same processes. Uh, that's, that's magic to me. Established in 1787, St. Genevieve's Memorial Cemetery may very well be Missouri's oldest. Many of the early pioneers are buried here, including John Scott. Scott was appointed to Missouri's first territorial legislature and is known to have taken several trips by horseback between Missouri and Washington, D.C. It was on one of those trips that Scott petitioned Congress to make Missouri a state. After drawing up a constitution with his fellow politicians, Missouri earned its statehood in 1821. So you're a software engineer who has a background in the restaurant business, done some construction too, and you're tired of living in the big city. What do you do? Well, if you're Mike Hankins, you buy an abandoned hotel built in 1790 and you transform it into the Southern Hotel Bed and Breakfast. We began coming here simply because I was an assistant scoutmaster and SBARF, the large uh, scout ranch, is down on 67. And so my wife and I began stopping here and we stayed in the, one of the motels several times and we stayed in one of the only bed and breakfast in town uh, and we enjoyed the town so much uh, that we look forward to coming and while we were here we were eating at the old brick and we looked over and there was a for sale sign in this window and she said and we never paid any attention to this we'd take to the others but you know, it just wasn't, wasn't very well taken care of. And she said, oh look, that's for sale. Can we buy that? We could have fun, we could just redo that. And I said to her, you know, we, we just can't buy a building just because we like it. She said, oh yeah, we can. We could turn it into a bed and breakfast. And I said, what do we know about bed and breakfast? She said, aren't we staying at one tonight? Don't we always try to stay at a bed and breakfast? Yes, don't we know what people like to eat? They like butter, they like service, they like nice things. We can make them feel warm and friendly and at home. And so we bought the building, we began this construction. But we love this town, the quietness of it, the friendliness of it. And that's why when she said, let's go to St. Genevieve, I thought, yeah, let's go to St. Genevieve. We always like to be there. And uh, we got inside to, to, to see the building, and it was in pretty poor shape, but the building looked sound to me. Uh, it, just, it just needed uh, a lot of work. But with Mike's background in construction and a team of 40 people, it only took nine months to complete and became the oldest, longest operating hotel or lodging establishment in the United States west of the Mississippi. It features 9,500 square feet, 12 fireplaces, country Victorian antiques, and an enchanting garden. And I love this town so much. It, it, it's, it is a historic town, but it's, it's not just the historic significance of the town. It's a living history. It's still there, it's still vibrant, uh, it's still active. And that's what's nice about small communities. They're all over the United States, these small towns, and we just happen to have one of the jewels, one of the diamonds. While the nearest bridge crossing the mighty Mississippi is over 30 minutes away, the St. Genevieve Modoc River Ferry operates year round. 
pending river conditions between St. Genevieve and Southern Illinois. Motorists and bicyclists from the Great River Road and the Mississippi River Bicycle Trail can enjoy easy access to two states for shopping, restaurants, and local sightseeing. Now we're at the Grapevine Grill on Shawmet Winery to talk with Chef Rob and learn about his Cajun-inspired dishes. So Chef Rob, tell us how the Grapevine Grill came to be on the Shawmet Winery. Well, Hank and Jackie Johnson purchased the property in 1990. He grew his first grapes in 95. And in 2002, they opened the tasting room. And people would come and have a good time and drink, and they wanted things to eat. So in 2003, he opened the Grapevine Grill. Um, then in 2007, he built the first villas, and so people could have a place to stay. And then you have a very extensive background as a chef. Tell us what started your passion in cooking. Sure. Uh, what started my passion was as a kid growing up in Louisiana, just with some phenomenal ingredients and grandparents and parents that just were phenomenal cooks. So I always had a passion for it as well. Uh, and then I went to Culinary Institute of America in Hyde Park, New York, and, and then worked a little bit all around the country just trying to find the different regional foods and working with the best ingredients. What brought me to Missouri originally was I was a corporate chef for an Italian restaurant and uh, moved here. And then through a mutual friend of Chalmette and myself, uh, found out about Chalmette, happened to have came out here and stayed before, fell in love with the place. When an opportunity opened itself up, uh, we moved here. And you brought a lot of that style from the South up here. Tell us about that too. Oh, for sure. Uh, we have you know Cajun Creole Southern roots, but not everything is spicy. Um, so we try to focus on using, again, things indigenous to our area, uh, local uh, produce and some meats and things from several different purveyors as well as our own garden. And Like every Friday we get in fish less than 24 hours out of the water from Honolulu. Uh, that's some of the best seafood I've ever bought. Uh, like we have our New Orleans style barbecue shrimp, which as opposed to the Midwest where it's a ketchup based barbecue, this is a beer and shrimp stock and butter base. Uh, we use the beer from Charleville, which is right up the hill from us. Uh, we use their half-wit beer and our sauce. Uh, it's got a nice spice to it, but again, we're incorporating some of the local, uh, locally produced items. Then we get big, giant Gulf shrimp and bake off some baguette bread. It has a nice spice and uh, enough earthiness to it to, to be a meal or an appetizer. Really, uh, uh, my cooking style is I just is based on what's available. Uh, like all the stuff that we saw come in earlier, uh, we'll find outlets for it and it'll all be gone by Sunday. So it just when I get a different ingredient, it excites me, then we figure out what we're gonna do with it so we can preserve the integrity of the ingredient and bring out the best flavors in it. How you feel each week is your favorite dish when we talked earlier. So what keeps you, what keeps you passionate about this and coming back to that kitchen every day? Uh, it's just all I've ever wanted to do. It's uh, literally been in my blood. Uh, my mother had a picture of me when I was barely three years old frying eggs, and it's never left me. Uh, the passion and the desire is still there, and I'm still fascinated with ingredients and new techniques and learning things and surrounding myself with some great people that make our lives a lot better, and we all learn and feed off of each other. Uh, you come in, it's just picturesque, the rolling hills, the beautiful vines. Uh, everywhere you look around here is magnificent. All of our wines are done in French style, and uh, my cooking style is classically French trained. Uh, so you combine the two, and it's just you know a match made in heaven. And uh, We come out, and we, we can adhere to any taste. If you like bold and spicy, we can give you that. And if you like just fresh and light and vibrant, we can provide you with that as well. Winemaking in St. Genevieve dates back about two centuries. French colonial pioneers, then German settlers, all grew grapes in calcium-rich soil on the rolling hills in the surrounding area. Today, visitors can still raise a glass and offer a toast at around a dozen vineyards and wineries, still carrying on that tradition in St. Genevieve wine country. Frescoes are traditionally defined as paintings done rapidly in watercolor on wet plaster typically walls and ceilings. But modern fresco artist Ali Cavanaugh has taken this style to places it's never been before with her engaging portraits. I would describe my work as figurative realism. I would describe myself as an expressionist. And I would say that my older work pre-2015 was very literal in its technique and application, and now the technique is a little more impressionistic, but it's still essentially figurative realism. 
Allie began her career as a professional artist, mostly working in oils. But when galleries weren't showing her paintings, she decided to branch out into watercolor. And then I had, at that time, I was painting for a show in Austin, Texas. And when I, I did like 15 oil paintings, but then when I took those paintings, I also thought, well, I'll frame up these little watercolor paintings just for fun, just put them in the show. So when I went to the show, everyone wanted to talk about the watercolors. Like, I just remember people kept pulling me over to the watercolors and like, these are so amazing. And I'm just thinking, I wasn't even taking that seriously. Those were just like fun little doodles in a way. But something clicked in me and I thought, you know what, there is something in the watercolor that is happening that is sitting differently with people and that I need to explore that. And there was no turning back. Her oldest daughter became her primary model and her audience grew. But her success isn't due to the media she uses to paint her subjects. It's her ability to identify and capture a moment in time. I think it's because when I was two years old, I lost a lot of my hearing to spinal meningitis. And so I have to read lips and look at body language, you know? I kind of have to look at the whole person and just being that way, just to communicate, I think it really made me in tune. And what's greater than people? I mean, what's more valuable than people? It's like each person has a story and this mystery about them. and. It's just the subject that, uh, to me, is just the best. I love it. You know, start to finish a painting, um, the first step would be the inspiration. It's the person that I see that I am like, wow, they, they would be an incredible person to paint. I'm with someone, we're just living life, whatever, and they just do something, you know, they, the light hits them. and. And it's like, I just feel it, you know, and I get grab my phone, quick shot, you know, just save it and then recreate that when I'm actually trying to gather my material to make the painting. You know, we set up a photo shoot and I try to recreate some of the things that I saw, you know, just kind of in the natural world. And, and all of my models are people that I know, they're in my life, they're friends, they're family, they're, you know, people in the community. And I, um, take the photos, hundreds and hundreds, just for one painting, and I just study them. I stare for a long time and really try to connect with the face and what kind of emotion, what composition is happening in the body. Sometimes there's not really the perfect photo to work from, but several photos together to get exactly what I want. And um, I draw it out first on the panel, and then I start laying the colors in. I'm always challenging myself with colors, new colors, uh, trying a different type of blue or a different type of green just to see what the material does. And I am always trying, when I'm actually going back to get my reference for a painting, I try to get the person to go inside of their head. It's the mystery of life and existence and it's like this intangible thing that makes you want to know more and sparks curiosity and all that. So that's what it is. I'm just trying to get, I'm trying to paint them when they get into like this introverted sort of place. I love painting people and, I, and I've tried doing landscapes and they're not good. But other people, that's where they see the soul, you know, and they, they paint those things with that connection. So it's, you should definitely be painting what you feel connected to. Famous ornithologist John James Audubon spent a short time in St. Genevieve in his early 20s. He was in the mercantile business with Jean Ferdinand Rozier, but his desire to study wildlife drew him back into the woods. In order to paint the birds in his illustrations in a more natural way, he developed a form of taxidermy using flexible wires in place of rigid rods, making his artwork more lifelike. Some of Audubon's mountain specimens are here at the St. Genevieve Museum. Have you ever wondered why there is an E on the end of Saint Genevieve? Well, the early colonists named their settlement after a woman, the patroness of Paris, France. The French spelling adds an E to the end of Saint to indicate gender. 
We hope you've enjoyed this short peek into the history, people, craftsmanship, and flavors of St. Genevieve. Before we bring this episode to a close, let's take one final look at the beauty of Missouri's oldest town. For everyone at KMOS TV, Missouri Life Magazine, and myself, thanks for watching. And tune in next time to spark your spirit of discovery and experience Missouri Life. More information is available on social media or online at KMOS.org. Production support is provided by Missouri Life Magazine. Missouri Life Magazine explores and celebrates the people, places, history, and destinations that make our state unique. Subscription information for Missouri Life Magazine can be found online at MissouriLife.com. And by viewers like you. Thank you.